Welcome to this Miao video seminar, or hybrid seminar, really, with uh, Elina Rönnberg uh, from the Department of Mathematics at Linköping University. So we're running this on Zoom and simultaneously uh, physically at Lund University. Let's see how that goes. And Elina is going to talk about the composition approaches for large-scale scheduling problems. So without further ado, please. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I, I think that's something that we can all agree on is that the generic discrete optimization solvers that are available today are, are really efficient. By putting together a reasonable model, you can solve fairly large scale and complex problems. Uh, and, and my talk today is about a situation where, where if you have an industrial partner in a project uh, and you want to solve an NP hard problem with hundreds of millions of binary variables, then they say, I don't care about it, that it's an MP hard problem. I just want you to solve it for me. And what you can do then by, by understanding the problem structure, apply the composition, and also uh, be careful with, with the pre-processing of data and so on. So that's the perspective uh, that I will have in this talk. Uh, and that's what we're going to get back to with the decomposition and, and using structure. So just a brief introduction, uh, this challenge, yeah, this is a challenging scheduling problem and, and it has to do with electronic systems in aircraft. But if we talk about it from an optimization perspective, it's multiprocessor scheduling, where you have precedence relations between your ta uh, tasks and you have a communication network to schedule. And I will get into the details later on. And the only thing you, you want to do here is to, to find a feasible schedule or prove that none exists. Uh, and to so solve this problem is, is of importance for the development of future aircraft. And the reason why you are interested in scheduling in this context is that uh, for a, a computer in, in an aircraft, you need to make sure that the software functions have the hardware resources that they need. You can't be in the situation with your laptop that you want to do something and then the system stalls and you need to wait until you get a response because if you're a pilot and you want to, I don't know, pull down the landing gear, it has to happen when you need it to happen. Uh, so, so it's about making sure that, that you have the hardware resources that, they, that you need all the time. And in this context, it's a configurable system where each configuration needs a schedule. So you schedule over and over again. And, and if you think about the design process of, of designing a new aircraft, you, you typically start with a, a minimum viable product and then you add functionality as you go along and this development project it, it goes on for, for several years and every time you have an update you need to, to schedule your system uh, and also when you're done with the product your, your customer might want updates so you change things again and then you need to schedule so scheduling is, is part of this design process and since we're talking about aircraft um, making changes is very expensive it's not just uh, switching one processor for another because you want more capacity or something. Because if you change anything on the hardware side, it's usually very costly. We're talking millions uh, to, to make changes, millions of euros. Uh, so it's not okay to try to schedule the problem and say, oh, sorry guys, I failed. Uh, then you need to prove that the hardware resources are not enough. So, and also to understand what kind of changes you need to make. Uh, and, I started my talk by saying that, okay, the, the uh, generic solvers are really powerful, but they are not powerful enough for, for this type of problem. So uh, the work I'm going to present is the result from a close collaboration between Lean Shipping and Saab. So from the Lean Shipping University side, we, we have the optimization perspective and, and Saab knows the technical background really well here. And for some time I was partially employed also by Saab to, to lead a, a research and, and development team there. So I've been a bit back and forth between uh, industry and academia. And, and part of the things that we did um, is, is what I'm going to present today. So, so the main task here was, was to, to implement a pre-runtime scheduling tool for a system that I'm going to describe uh, to uh, in just a few slides. Uh, and uh, the focus here is the, the composition approaches that we applied, where we use the problem structure, but we also wanted to use as, as much 
computational power from, from the generic solvers as possible. So we didn't want to develop everything from scratch. And in a project like this, it's also a lot about pre-processing and exploring data in a good way. And in addition to the exact approaches, we also developed some mathematical components. So, so today's talk is really an overview of this project. I, I will try to highlight the important aspects of the decomposition that we did and compare the properties. And I will skip all the messy details. But if you want to ask questions about this afterwards, we, we can discuss it in more detail then. So, so the outline of the talk is like this. So first this brief introduction, and I will also give a technical background to this problem. And if you're not that interested in the background, it's possible to, to enter the talk again when we get to the optimization part. But just to give an idea on, on why we're solving this problem. And then we will look at the problem formulation and, and the structure of the problem the, to understand the decomposition approaches that we applied. And then there will be some concluding comments. So we start from the beginning. Uh, I mean, the, the attempts to, to fly, they, they trace back, far back in, in history. And it was not until the early 1900s that they were successful with the first flights. And Saab, who is the industrial partner in this project, was an early contributor in, in this area. And if we look at the, the time between mid-1930s and mid-1960s, um, that's something that's called the mechanical era. And, and then um, aircraft were, were typically mechanical machines. Uh, that's how, how, how you built them. And, and when you wanted to change, change something, then you built a completely new machine. So they, like Saab, they, they had a new aircraft every third year or something like this in this part, um, part of history. But then with dig digital systems and, and software functionality and so on, the notion of an aircraft really changes. So nowadays, uh, an aircraft is more or less um, a computer with wings. It's something, something else. And, and uh, I've probably used the word avionics already. And, and this means simply electronics in an aircraft. And, and when I talk about electronics, I, I mean everything from sensors that gather information, units where the information is processed, actuators that control the aircraft, and also equipment like screens and and lights that, that presents information to the, to the pilot. And what we, we do in this project is that we prescribe down, down to the nanosecond what the electronic does at all times. And a question? Yes. And this will be, this schedule is independent of what happens? like or it's yes. in reaction to uh, so so the schedule will say what function is allowed to do things but the actual data it depends on what happens in real time um was that the question so like a, a number of times per second you're checking in with component x yes yeah. and then if component x has detected something that it should take care of mm. It has its chance during this time slot. Yes, to send that data, for example. But I, I will get into the details, yes. Um, so, so and, and the key point here, uh, when you design an avionics system, the most important thing is that you can trust the system. Uh, nothing can, is allowed to go wrong. And for those of you who know real-time systems and real-time systems design, you know that this is a complete area, how to design systems that you can trust. But I, I won't use that type of vocabulary today. I will just talk in more like engineering common sense. What do you need to think about when you when you design a system like this? And examples of things that you need to consider is that when, when you if you look at all the subsystems in your system, you need to be able to validate them independently to make sure that they do the right things. And you need to make sure that faults cannot propagate between your functions. You need to make sure that all possible scenarios are covered and evaluated and this doesn't in this context it doesn't only mean that if you look at your if statements that you cover all your cases it means that okay we need to know what happens to the aircraft if the computer crashes at this line <laughs> what happens then will, will, will the plane crash or how do we handle an error and also, you need to make sure that all the information, the data you, you send is correct and also protected from unauthorized uh, access. 
So, so this, to design a system like this, it's an extensive documentation and testing and certification process to make sure that you can trust the system. And, and this is important to understand when I present how the system is designed to understand the reasons behind it. Uh, so in, in the early days, uh, the design they used then was based on, on having a federated system. And that essentially means that you have, um, if you want to have a function, then you build an electronic box that handles that function. And if that function needs to talk with another function, then you had a cable between the two boxes and then you could send data. Uh, and so you had a really hardwired system. And this means that, that integration and verification is rather simple uh, because it's not very complex, but, but it's limited with respect to the synergy and system integration, right? And, and also when, when you look at, at discussions about how to design this, when you have a federated system and when they grew, the weight of the cables of aircraft actually became an issue because when you had a lot of data sent between the different functions then you had a lot of cables and then we talk hundreds of kilos of, of, of cables and as i said also earlier times times are changing and here i, I used an illustration this is an example of a, of a u.s um, military aircraft and on the x-axis you have the years and then the number of lines of, of, of code in an aircraft. And, and you can take any aircraft. I just found, found this picture online and, and could use it, but, but it looks similar for, for all types of, of planes. Uh, so, so now we, when we have all the digital systems and uh, computers in our aircraft that gives us new possibilities. And of course the, the system complexity has increased. And it also introduced new needs because now you can talk about upgrading your system, you can adapt it, you can reconfigure it, you can by just changing functions. And this led then to, to a change of, of design philosophy. And I think this, this is an example that I got from, from Saab. Um, if you remember some years back, uh, maybe we had all of these gadgets. Uh, and if we wanted to go running, for example, then we used our GPS for finding the way and we used our watch to, to take the time. And if we wanted to tell a friend how, how, um, um, how we did, then we picked up the phone and, and called them. Uh, and nowadays, I would say that most people have a smartphone that can do all of this. And this means that we have, instead of different gadgets, we have applications on the same unit. And uh, this means, I mean, the integration, you don't need to, to look at the GPS and then look at your watch. You can just, you have it on, on the same unit. But at the same time, if something goes wrong and, and your phone stalls for some reasons, then, then the functions can, can interact with each other. But this is also another way to see the system in, in the aircraft industry. And, and the modern design is to have an integrated and modular system. And this means that you share hardware between different functions, and then you have the software defining the functionality. So that's a different perspective. And of course, then it's much easier to have synergies and integration, but it becomes much more complex to make sure that you don't um, have any interference between things. And this is, I would say that this is how, it, how it's done for, for most manufacturers nowadays. And what, what you need to do to, to be able to handle this complexity is that you, you need to have a separation between the software and the hardware. So, so you have, you consider it as separate things. You have the software and then you have the hardware and then you have something in between and i will just call it the glue here but it, it will contain the operating system the middleware and um, tools for configuration automatic tests and so on so this glue is is designed to handle this this complexity and one of the responsibilities of this glue that i call it is to allocate the hardware resources to the software processes and that is an important part of making uh, sure that the system can be trusted and if we look in more detail at the, the hardware view here, there are also two separate layers. So one layer, which I call the application layer, it's what it's what the application developers see, the software developers. They, they see that, oh, I have a sensor, I have some processing unit and so on. 
that I can use to, to uh, execute my functions. Um, and then we have a communication layer that's essentially an infrastructure to provide communication. And now we're talking more in, in detail about the, the design case from, from SOP. And to separate these two means that if you want to, let's say you have a simple function that wants to read some sensor data. Now we're back to, to, to the question here. You want to read some sensor data, you want to make some calculations, and then you want to show some digits on a display, for example. Then you can't just pass the, the ah, I can show here, pass the data uh, horizontally in this layer. You have to use the communication layer all the time. So you need to go via the communication modules and the communication network and back and forth. So, so that's, but this is something that the developers, don't, they don't see this aspect of the problem. They only see what the, the units, the units that they can use. And an important aspect of the, the, this design case is that the, the system is completely synchronous. So everyone knows what the time is all the time. So you have a sense of time. Uh, and um, the communication activities are explicitly scheduled and data is available at a determined point in time. So all the time the system knows which function can do what, but the actual contents of the data or the contents of the calculations, that's of course not known. That's a runtime thing. Uh, if we look at the communication network, it's a, it's a regular switched ethernet, uh, but the protocol is uh, defined so that messages are sent in discrete time slots. And the benefits from this are that, that you, you have access to the full bandwidth at that instance. If, if it's your time to send data, you can use the full bandwidth. So you can push a lot of data very, very quickly. Um, and then because uh, it's a synchronous system, you, will, you also know exactly when the data will arrive. And it's, um, the protocol is also such that you can uh, have multicast. You can send to several receivers at a time. And, and one key part of making this happen is, is these communication modules, because they prepare and handle all the information that is sent on the communication network. And we will get back to, to the role that they have when we look at the optimization problem. But here, you have a lot of things need to happen on the communication modules to, to schedule um, a message. So just to summarize a bit about this uh, design case that we look at, um, one important aspect is that we have independence between different applications by this pre runtime schedule that we create, which gives you a start time for all activities. And then you have the, the, the worst case execution time for all the activities. So you know which resources that you need to allow. Uh, and then the spatial partitioning is made by the engineers. They, they say, I want to, to use that unit for those computa computations, for example. So we only care about the temporal aspect here. Uh, and because we have this separation, you can develop both develop, verify, and simulate all the functions in isolation. And that's important for the verification and so on. And also, um, they say that the system is adaptable by design. It's designed to be changed over and over again. It's easy in some sense to upgrade and reconfigure the system. But the cost of this, because there are many benefits of this design, but, but I would say that the cost is this highly advanced glue that you have between the software and the hardware layer. It gets rather complicated to handle all of these aspects, both from, from an engineering perspective, but also uh, related to the scheduling that we will look at. Uh, so, but this is just to give you an idea about about which problem we're, we're looking at. Um, are there any more questions about the, the background? Um, I'm a little bit curious. So, I mean, um, just to understand the problem you're solving, there could also be, in addition to all of this, I guess there could be electronic warfare going on messes up your electronics. It, would that be part of what you're modeling or someone else just make sure that you're functioning more or less according to specification? Yes, so so I, I would say that uh, there are other mechanisms to handle such things. Yes, um, so that's not something that's considered with respect to the scheduling, no. Okay, so then we continue on and, and 
I, I think it's a good idea to start from scratch here again with, with the problem formulation. So if I wouldn't have time to give you the technical background, this is where I would start. But now I got a bit longer time from Jakob, so then I could talk about everything. Um, if I look at this problem from an optimization perspective, a, I would have a view that looks like this. So I have a communication network that connects a set of nodes. And in each node, I have a communication module that's responsible for the communication between the nodes and also to external systems, and also between the different application modules that could be in the same node. So, so these are really, these communication modules are really central guys in this system, as, as you will see when I show you um, some instance um, on the later slide. And the application modules are important because the, those are the, the units that actually do things that run the software processes. So this is where the actual functions happen. And uh, from an optimization perspective, what we want to do is to create a cyclic schedule. And the schedule only needs to be one second long. And that's this second is a major frame in this system. And that might sound like a short schedule, but when you consider that the time resolution is in nanoseconds, it's, it's actually a rather long schedule. You have 10 to the power of nine time points. And it's, it's a feasibility problem. So we need to find a feasible solution or show that there is no, no feasible solution. And if I want to describe this as, a, as an optimization problem, I would categorize it as a multiprocessor scheduling problem where I need to schedule periodic tasks. And we, we need to make a distinction here. When we look at the problem structure a bit later also, um, there's a huge difference between the application modules and the communication modules. On the application modules, we have rather few tasks, but they are very long, and we need to schedule them several times per major frame. If we look at the communication modules, we have instead a huge number of tasks, they are rather short, and we only have one instance per major frame. Uh, between these periodic tasks, we can have dependencies, which is a precedence relation with a time lag. And that could be between two tasks on the same module or between two tasks on, on different modules in the same node. So essentially, from an optimization perspective, yes, I think I have a question. Yes, I was just wondering, will uh, the... I think you're... Sorry, we can't hear you. Um, yeah, but okay. you need to increase the sound of the... I see. I, I, I can write it instead. Yeah. Now you hear me? Now we can hear you. I need Thanks. to change something on the... Of yeah. course. Yeah. No, I just wondering, so the tasks are the same at every cycle, or can yeah. there be allowed multiple tasks that have not appeared before and repeated tasks? No, so, so uh, the schedule is exactly the same each second. Uh, so that, I mean, because the schedule only specifies the, the resources that will be available for different functions. Um, but, but if you look at the application modules, they have several instances per major frame, 64 to be exact. So because that's things that are repeated 64 times per second. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, so, but from an optimization perspective, this is rather straightforward. We need to sequence the tasks on these modules and we, they need a starting time. Um, if we look at the communication aspect of the, the problem, I have want to just going to illustrate it by an example. We have the communication network here in the middle, and then we have a sending communication module and a receiving communication module. And essentially, uh, messages are sent in discrete time slots. So we need to decide uh, which um, time slot should we, should we use for this message. Uh, but to be able to, to send this message, a series of activities need to happen. I call them P, S, Q, and R here. Uh, so by, by placing the message here and um, to send this message here, I need to execute these tasks also. But, but essentially, um, it's only about choosing a time slot for each, mes each, mes each message. That's difficult to say. Uh, but the tricky part here is sh that the choice of time slot puts some additional restrictions on the tasks that are involved. And I will also just illustrate this by an example. 
So if we look at an example with one message here, the choice of time slot will uh, have an impact on the release times and deadlines of some of the tasks. So if I put the message here, there will be some additional restrictions on these tasks that are involved. And if we look at an example with two messages, uh, there will also be some requirements on the relative order between the tasks. So if I put the messages in this order, in this order, I need to have the same order between S1 and S2 and between Q1 and Q2. This is not a requirement on the P and R tasks. So, so they, they are not affected by the order, but the intermediate task, um, the task immediately before and after are affected by the order of the messages. And this is for technical reasons for the protocol to work. And the, the last thing is that since you have access to the full bandwidth in each time slot, uh, you, you might be able to send more than one message at a time. And the benefit from doing that is that you save a lot of, you save some resources on your application modules. Um, so, so what happens here is that, that you save 50% of the time for the P, Q, and R uh, tasks. And, and the S1s actually, it, they are merged in, into one. So you save a lot on, on those. Uh, so, so this is something that needs to be part of, 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 the, of, of solving the problem to decide if to send them together and, and uh, to take into account the interaction here between the communication and task scheduling. So, and, and before we look at, at how to solve the problem, I want to give you an example of, of, an, of, a, uh, of an instance that's of relevance. So this is, after working on this project for some time, we concluded that this is the goal for the project with Saab. We should be able to, to solve instances of, of this magnitude. And I will illustrate this. We have the communication network here, and then we have the nodes. Uh, and if we look here, the number of messages, it's just below 4,000. And if we look at the application modules here, for example, it's 14 tasks uh, that are repeated 64 times. And here it's seven times 64. And on this one, we have two application modules with four on each times 64. And if we look at this aspect of the problem, it's rather reasonable. This is something that we probably could solve rather easily. Uh, but the challenge is here. So this one is the worst. Here we have over 16,000 tasks on this communication module that needs to be sequenced. Uh, so just keep these figures in mind when we look at the problem structure and, and how to solve this problem. And when we realized that, okay, the, the full scale instance, it's, it's rather challenging. We asked them, okay, do you have like a toy example that we can start with? And then we got this one that's significantly easier than the one I showed you, of course. Uh, and we tried to make some MIP modeling and try to solve it, but within a week of computational time, we didn't get a, even a feasible solution. And we also tried some CPU approaches, but at the time and in the ways that we tried it, we were not even able to find a feasible solution for this instance. So before we continue with how we solve the problem, I want to summarize the problem analysis that we did. And I would say that the main computational challenges here are the interaction between the task and communication scheduling, because that's a messy part of the problem. You make a decision about the communication and that affects um, the, the, the task scheduling. And if you look at the, the communication modules, this is really a challenge. You have a huge number of tasks to, to, um, to sequence. And since I'm from, from the MIT community, I, I tend to think in terms of, of MIT formulations of a problem like this. And, and if you look at, at um, an order-based formulation, you need to make yeah, some, something uh, like 100 million um, task I before J decisions. And if you try with the, with a the time index formulation, which is very common in, in, in mid settings, you get something like 10 to the power of 12 uh, decisions that you need to make. So, so this is really a challenge, how, how to handle the sequencing of, of this many tasks. Um, and there are some important design considerations to keep in mind. It's a feasibility problem. We should remember that. 
and uh, we need to, to find a way to, to handle this interaction between the communication and task scheduling. And we need to handle the sequencing. And I mentioned from, from the MIP um, aspect here, how, how do you handle a formulation like this? And, and probably the time in this formulation will be very challenging. Could you do something with an order-based formulation? Maybe. These are questions that I will answer today. Uh, and also we looked at, at CP uh, approaches, if they are better equipped for, for such sequencing. And also there were some, some good news. We had some challenges that we observed, but there were also some good news because we found some problem structure that we could, could use. Uh, and both of the decomposition schemes, because we have a feasibility problem um, and, and we want to be able to prove infeasibility, uh, a promising type of decision uh, decomposition scheme would, would be something like this, that we, we start with some pre-processing and then we solve a relaxed problem. And, and that means that you, you have a problem that uh, with a larger set of feasible solution than, than your original problem, because if this relaxed problem doesn't have a solution, then you know, then you have a proof of infeasibility. So we thought that, okay, it would be nice to have a component like that. If we can't address the, the complete problem directly, if we look at the relaxation and know that this is infeasible, then we know that our, our problem is infeasible. And then it would be nice to, to have this relaxed problem designed in a way that if we have a solution to the relaxed problem, then we can use this solution to restrict the solution space and define a subproblem and design this subproblem so that if we solve this subproblem, we, we get a schedule. And if we fail at this, we gain some knowledge that we can give back to the relaxed problem and strengthen this relaxation a bit to try again. Uh, so, so this is the type of scheme that, that I will, that um, is fundamental for both of the approaches that I will show you shortly. Uh, so, so that's one aspect. And, and then if we look at the, at the problem structure and huge number of tasks, um, if we look at the original data, if we look at the technical specification, it says that there is a release time and a, a deadline and the tasks need to be executed in between uh, those. But then if you dig a bit further and look at other technical restrictions and you, if you use ideas from, from constraint programming and, and um, propagate this um, information between the tasks, you can actually conclude that in a feasible solution, task one, for example, it can't be in all places of this interval. You can remove some parts of the interval and say that in a feasible schedule, only these sub-intervals can be used. So this is a way to reduce the problem. Uh, and, and this turned out to be, to be an important observation. Uh, because if we look at, again, now I speak from the perspective of, of making task I before J decisions to, to decide on the order between the tasks. Is there an impact if you consider the sum intervals instead? And if we looked at the original data for the really large instance, uh, and even if we did some pre-processing and only created the decision variables that are actually needed, uh, they were still a lot. Uh, but if we take these sub-intervals into account when we create the variables that are needed, we could reduce them by a factor of 10. Uh, so, so a lot of things happen when we consider these sub-intervals. And also, we, we just made some preliminary attempts. So, okay, if we choose exactly which sub-interval to use, does it, that affect the number of decisions that we need to make? And it turned out, yes, then we have another factor of 10. So, so this was one important step in our, in our work. Um, and, and then that made us view the, the model like this. So, so um, to, to have some idea on how to, to um, look at this problem, uh, we can say that there is a hierarchy of decisions here. Um, and by that, I mean, which ones have the most impact on the, the other decisions. And uh, this, I would say that uh, on top, in, on top uh, we have the, the sequencing of tasks on the application modules, because these tasks are very long, they are few, and if those decisions are made, it restricts the remaining solution space quite, quite a lot. Um, 
The second uh, decision in this hierarchy is to assign messages to slots. And, and that's both because this is a messy aspect of the model, uh, but also because it has a large impact on the remaining structure. Because if you remember, if those decisions are made, we have additional uh, release time deadline restrictions, order between tasks that are determined and so on. So if this decision is made, th the problem becomes much simpler. And, and third on my list here is the task to interval uh, assignments, uh, because you can make rather informed decisions here without actually sequencing the tasks, because you can add some you can strengthen your formulation and, and make rather good choices with respect to the intervals that you use. This would require some more time to explain in detail, but you can make rather informed decisions without the actual sequencing. And if you have such decisions, then the only thing you have left is, is sequencing of tasks. And, and still it's computationally challenging because you have a lot of tasks, but it, at least it's, it's a well-known structure in some sense that you're, that you're left with. So, so these are the, the ideas that we had from our analysis of the problem. And uh, the next step here is to present how we use this for our decomposition, if you remember the schema that I, I drew. Um, so we, I will show you two approaches today. And they differ uh, both in which decisions that are made by the master problem and the sub problem and also in the feedback information. Uh, so, and if you look at the first one, we will have all of these three types of decisions made by the master problem, and then we will solve a sub problem that includes all of these. And if we look at the other decomposition approach, we don't place them in sub intervals. We save that completely for the sub problem. And if we, yeah, and, and then we should also remember that those preliminary experiments that I showed you that OK, if, if these decisions are made, then it means a magnitude of 10 in the number of decisions that remains. But still, you will see that it was a good idea to, to not include them in the master problem. Um, and I hope I will be able to convey why. So, But if, if we look at the first one, then the master problem, this relaxed problem that we talked about, was about placing tasks in sub-intervals and messages in slots. And, and the only thing I can say about the model is that it's messy uh, because there are so many details and, and it turned out to be very challenging for Garobi to, to solve also. I will show you this a bit later also. And the sub problem that we defined was about sequencing of tasks uh, when the tasks are placed in their sub intervals. And we formulated in a way that we penalized if tasks uh, caused conflicts with respect to, to to the sequencing. So we had an order-based MIP formulation where we tried to sequence as many tasks as possible. And if it wasn't possible to avoid an overlap, then this was penalized. Then we could find the, the cause of the conflict. Uh, and the feedback information here was to say that next time we solve the master problem, make sure that this set of tasks do not overlap. So that was the kind of feedback information. And I would say that our mindset here, because we have quite a lot of pressure to be able to, to prove infeasibility, it's important here. So we wanted to have a strong relaxation that can really discover this infeasibility. And if it seems feasible, then we should find a schedule. So that's the mindset in this design. Uh, so the resulting scheme looks like this. Um, I think the figure contains um, everything that I've already said. And we chose to, to use Guru before for solving these problems. Uh, and the reason why, why we thought that this was an interesting design idea was that, OK, when we look at the complete problem from scratch, we, we know that we have a magnitude of some hundred of millions of, of, of binary decisions. We can apply the pre-processing that gets us down to around 10 million, and then another factor of 10 here. And that's something that we actually can, can solve. So we needed both of these steps to, to, have, to be able to, to sequence the tasks. Uh, and if we, if we apply this decomposition approach in this pure form that I showed you now, uh, and we, we take this toy example, 
we saw that in less than a minute. Uh, so, so that's a significant improvement uh, compared to, to not solving it at all, of course. Uh, and and the, that from this result, we felt, okay, it's promising. This is probably a way uh, to, to exploit the structure here. And it turned out to work well also on this slightly larger instance here. Uh, but if we take one step further and, and look at this instance, uh, we started to struggle when we wanted to solve the, the relaxed model the first time it took almost 12 hours and that then we knew that okay this will be a problem so, so the bottleneck of this model is to, to, to solve the relaxed problem and if we take it one step further we couldn't even solve it in 24 hours so it took us part of the way but but not the whole way as you see uh, and our conclusion was that if we have a communication module with more than 10,000 tasks, uh, it, it, it's even if we don't do the full sequencing, it's too expensive with all the valid inequalities and stuff that we added to make this work. So, so the conclusions here is that, okay, we had a really strong relaxation of the problem and that's what we wanted, but it was a bit too expensive. And um, the industrial partners say, but we want to solve larger instances, you have to do something. And then we, we agree that, okay, we, we can include some heuristic components here. So we, we chose to turn this method into math, math heuristic. And uh, what we did was that we developed the myth-based adaptive large neighborhood search that we apply to this relaxed problem. And I won't go into details about this design because it's rather problem specific, but we, we did some things here to, to, to search for, for feasible solutions to, to this relaxed problem in, in, in a better way. And, and um, that, that meant we could solve this in three days. And I think now after polishing a bit, uh, we can solve it in, in a day or so. Um, Yes. So, like this time frame of a day, is, is it like, did, did you mean before that you want to solve it in one second? No. So, so the, the schedule for the electronics is one second. And so, so if we look, if we talk about solution times here, it's the time that the engineers need to wait to know if the functionality they developed can be used. Oh, okay. Yeah. Too long, uh, but it's better than not being able to solve the problem at all. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it, it was, yeah. Uh, this is like an intermediate result. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Um, so, so what happens is that you um, you design all your functions. You have your hardware, and then it's part of compiling the system. So, so the schedule is part of that, and then you take your electronic box and, and then you plug it into to the, the aircraft. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, good question. So and so so yeah, um, we like the composition. So we we also wanted to try another approach uh, based on logic based vendors decomposition. And here we decided to, to make uh, the relaxed problem uh, not as strong as, as before. So, so we decided to only assign messages to slots and, and not to, to assign them to these sub intervals. And this gives still a rather messy MIT model, but it's not challenging for Grobe to solve it. Uh, it's much easier. And then we needed to have a, a somewhat different sub problem. And Again, we need to sequence the tasks, and this time they are not placed in their sub intervals, but that's okay. And we decided to not have an objective, but to instead just determine if, if this assignment is feasible or not. Uh, because then the, the feedback information we could use to the, to the master problem is, is simply no good cuts. And if we do this in a naive way, it will take forever. So, so I will also show you a bit about the acceleration techniques. But essentially, this means that you make an assignment, you check if this assignment is feasible or not, and otherwise you say you can't do this assignment. Um, so, so here the mindset was not as much on on, um, on discovering infeasibility, but we wanted to find ways to find the schedule faster. Um, so 
again, the same scheme here, more or less, uh, some small changes. I, I put not likely here because it makes a difference that we have a weaker formulation here. And the feedback information is a vendor's cut. And now we use Kurobi here and uh, IBM's CP solver here. So, and, and to make, um, I mean, logic-based vendors in, in its pure form gets naive in some sense. Uh, so, so you need to, to apply some acceleration techniques to make it work. And um, uh, one important aspect is to, to strengthen the cuts. Uh, and another is to strengthen the master problem by a sub-problem relaxation. So we strengthened it a bit, but not as much as in the first approach. And for us, it was also important to have a good initial solution. And also part of our, our work was to design a new acceleration technique that turned out to work really well. But this, these are the things that I want to discuss during our, our technical discussion. So I, I won't say anything else about this. I will just show you res the results from it. Um, some computational comparisons. I, I only took the results for, for the most challenging public instances that we had. We, I can't show you the, the sub instances, but we created some artificial data also. Um, and uh, we ran this on the same cluster, but where we have both fat and thin nodes. And for the first decomposition approach, we really needed to use these fat nodes because we, it required a lot of memory. But for, for the second approach, we, we don't need that much memory. So when we look at times later on, it's unfair with respect to, to memory use. Just something to keep in mind. And if you look at the pure methods in some sense, you can see, yes. Yeah, I just realized I should have asked way earlier. Can you say something about, I mean, you have, you said you have tons of variables. Uh, are these, I mean, what fraction of them would be like floating points and some are maybe integral, some are just binary? Um, the, the, um, I mean, you have like con a continuous variable for each, uh, task because you need a time for it and you but then i mean what dominates here are the um task i before j decisions and those are binary um and those in in the um in yeah in a sub problem they would be around a couple of millions uh, but if you would look at, at, the, at the monolithic model, it would be hundreds of millions of those binary decisions. Um, but was this your question? Yes, uh, I think, but also, but, but that means that when, okay, so yeah, you got three as domino, I should have asked this earlier probably, but once you, like you described some approach as doing the scheduling thing and then figure, like, I guess, are, are you like, setting the real value variables and then you have like a boolean problem left is that one thing that would happen or you always have like a no you always have an ilp or really a mixed it's always the mixed integer program because you have some of the binary decisions that you need to make and i mean the key point of the composition is to really make some of these binary decisions to have a, an easier sub problem to solve but the continuous decisions, they are so, in the myth context, they are so cheap comparably. So we didn't even bother how many they, they were and how to handle them because that follows like automatically for us um, in the techniques that we use. Um, um, and if we look at the results here, you can see that uh, here we have time on the x-axis and the number of these 30 instances that we have solved. and it, for, for the first approach, it took like uh, over 30 hours before we even solved one instance. Um, and uh, the composition approach too were, was rather successful with some of them and then nothing really happened. But if we also look at the improvements that we added, when we included this adaptive large neighborhood search in the composition approach one, you can see that we solve all but two in 72 hours, which was okay when we talk about problems like this. Uh, and it looks even better for the composition approach to if we apply this new acceleration technique that we designed, then then it's only one instance that we couldn't solve in 72 hours. Um, and I mean, it's steeper here. And um, so 
many of the instances are solved rather quickly. And these instances are all satisfied, and there is a solution to be found, or is there some like, no, there is no schedule and you can do it? No, I, I think we were a bit worried about, uh, uh, we, we for, the, for this public set of instances that we created, we only took instances that we knew had a feasible solution, yes. But we've um, also worked, we've encountered some instances without a feasible solution during our work also, but we chose not to include them in, in the test sets. Um, yes so um just to, to summarize about these these different sub problems it's about sequencing of tasks and a lot of tasks and uh, a comparison here is that in the first problem we have an objective in our sub problem in, and in the other one we have a feasibility problem only and in the first one we restrict them to the sub interval and in the other one we don't so so these are the two two approaches and, and an interesting aspect here is that if we try to use the the cp solver for for this problem we fail <laughs> and if we try to use Kurobi for this problem we also fail too. but they perform rather well in in these two different categories and that was something that we learned in this project uh, none of them can handle this case and this one is not really interesting so it was very important here to to use the the right paradigm uh, for, for solving the problem and then we didn't even try that so maybe that's something we should should have done um not as long as you have really valid variables no 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 then no of course yeah um part of the reason why i was curious but uh, yeah. but the integral variables like do you need integers or do you just need zero and one no you could you could handle them as integers, but uh, I mean, you have integers to the range of 10 to the power of 9, so yeah. Um, but now you're talking about the mean value. Yes. Yeah, but the, the okay, let's focus on the, the, in, the integral variables. Yes, they are mainly binary. Mainly. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I mean, the, the, the reason I, I'm you, you could always formulate problems in different ways. So maybe it's possible to formulate it somehow as a purely binary problem. Uh, you can have one binary variable for each, like, like this time index formulation. Is task I uh, starting at time point T or not? Uh, then you can have everything binary. Uh, but uh, I'm not, yeah, but you- Like discretize time and then- Yes. Yeah, but that depends on how fine your discretization Yes, is. yeah, because then you have- blow up. Yeah, it will blow up. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so just a final summary. So, so we looked at this sub-avionics design case where we have a configurably a configurable safety critical electronic system that is designed to support this distributed uh, system development and it's a synchronous system where we do this pre-runtime scheduling and, and the price for this flexibility is, is this challenging optimization problem that we want to solve uh, and and i think it's a, a fairly good example of, of when you can understand problem structure and apply the composition methods to solve a problem that you would otherwise fail to, to solve um, and i think that's the main message here and uh, then some acknowledgement and some paper references so, thank you very much Thank you. Yes. Uh, I think we had a, a few questions already. We're going to have the opportunity to ask even more questions in the technical part after the break. But are there any questions now? Yes. Um, to reference correctly, the setting is kind of development setting. They make some changes and then we want to verify the event. Um, so I was wondering if yeah, could we somehow have an incremental approach where you reuse your last solutions yeah. and also make Made not the solutions, but like reasoning made mm. by by the solver for like paper instances. Yes. So you you could 
oh, yeah, you could initialize from a previous schedule and, and you can use, uh, we haven't, um, oh, let's put it like this. Uh, this, the type of design that we have in this the composition scheme would allow to, to warm start from, from previous schedules and so on. But we haven't really used that, um, yeah, because we didn't really focus on, we didn't have instances and data that showed this incremental um, design. We only had this instance and this instance, and they were all separate. But that's, it's part of the design to, to be able to use it like that, but we haven't done it yet. But I agree with you, it's an important aspect in, with respect to how it's used by the engineers. Yes. Um, because you shouldn't change more than you need to. Um, Uh, at the end of the day, this is a feasibility problem. Yes. yes. And yeah. so the optimization problems that you were solving along the way were like what was the objective? Um, so for, um, let's see, it depends on which one we start with. Uh, for, for the uh, in this case, in the second one, uh, the sub problem was a feasibility problem only. And one detail that I didn't mention about this approach was that we, we constructed a certain sub problem that we solved to get an initial solution to our relaxed problem, a bit in line with what uh, you asked about. And then we, we try, the objective here was to mimic the last solution uh, as much as possible so that when we solve the problem again with new information we change as little as possible um, and and that uh, so, so the objective of the relaxed problem was to change as little as possible and to only resolve the conflict that we added <laughs> in that sense and, and that was important to make things work well in practice um, in this one, uh, the main objective was to, uh, because um, here we, we had a, form, a penalty formulation. So, so we allowed for an infeasible solution to start with that one. And then we decreased the penalty until we found a feasible solution, because then we could continue on to the, to the sub problem. And then when we added a conflict, we get infeasibility again. And then we use this penalized model and decrease the penalty until it's feasible again. And then, so that's the way the objectives are used here. And in the sub problem of this one, uh, it's about finding, uh, we want to find a small um, subset of tasks that are in, in conflict also. Um, Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So then I think we um, take a break and then we discuss how to recommend our tools.